All right, joining me for this one, we have the Athletics' Phil Hay and also our Chelsea writer, Liam Toomey, who was there to witness the Cole Palmer show at Stamford Bridge on Saturday. Look, Liam, let's start with you, right? It has been a, a positive start to the season for Chelsea. Four wins, one defeat and one draw. And at the centre of it is a player who has six goals, four assists and in six Premier League matches. That player, of course, is Cole Palmer. Um, what did you make of his display, considering you saw it face-to-face -face on Saturday? Honestly, I thought it was only his second-best four-goal haul since he joined Chelsea. And that's the conversation we're having about Palmer now. You know, you have to rank his three, four goal performances. That was his third match ball. He's played mm. fewer than 40 games for Chelsea. He's got as many hat-tricks as Drogba and Lampard now. So that this guy has elevated himself in rapid time to really lofty conversations to the point where, despite how crazy Erling Haaland's start to the season was, it is a legitimate conversation, I think, whether Cole Palmer is the best attacker in the Premier League. Uh, and he, what's astonishing about him is the level of consistency. You know, he emerged when he came to Chelsea almost fully formed mm -hmm. at this star level. And 43 goal involvements since the start of last season in the Premier League. It's just a remarkable level of consistency and impact. And there's no sign of him slowing down. He said after he said after that game that, you know, he's taken the first couple of weeks to get up to speed because he didn't have pre season. He didn't go with Chelsea to the US. He certainly looks up to speed now and I think we can expect to see more of the same. Yeah, uh, Phil Lim just spoke about those 43 uh, goal involvements in last season. That's 15 uh, assists and 28 goals. The other person beneath him is Erling Haaland, right? Uh, what are we witnessing here from, from a purely football perspective is are we looking at a legend of the future here you're looking at mega potential i mean i i laughed at that line from liam on twitter and he said you know it's probably only his second best full goal haul it's <laughs> sorry like everton it's, 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 it, it's like that thing in the simpsons of it's you know it's the worst day of your life so far you know it's yeah. just like the, the goals are, are coming and coming um I agree that he's he's definitely in the conversation with Haaland um, when it comes to the best attacker in the Premier League, and I think I do feel like there's there's more to Palmer's game than there is to to Haaland's, which is not to to knock Haaland in in any way. And I think over the course of the season, you'll see Haaland score more goals than mm. Palmer because of the the finisher he is and because of the chances he has at, at City, and it's just you know all round excellent centre forward. Um, but I'm really impressed with the way that Palmer has settled at Chelsea, just because and Liam knows this better than me. It seems like a difficult environment at Stamford Bridge or, or not an easy environment to, to step into. And given how many players are there and how many players Chelsea tend to recruit, not even even if you, you are as good as Palmer, not an easy place to, to walk into and start playing regularly. It's not in any way a given for Palmer any more than anybody else who's, mm. who's come into that squad. Um, and the, the longer it goes on, the more you see of him and, and his all-round game, the more you think that the, the £40 million pounds or thereabouts that Chelsea paid for him yeah, is an absolute steal. Um, and I think as time goes on, and I think we'll, we'll get into discussing mm. whether it was the right decision on, on City's part, but I think as time goes on, that will come to be seen as, as very, very undervalued. Um, and I think if you sold him now, you'd, you'd almost treble your money. Yeah, for sure. Um, you mentioned it earlier, Liam. Um, more hat tricks than Drogba, Frank Lampard, Jimmy Floyd, Hasselbank. Um, you know, 39 league appearances for the club he's only made, actually. Um, does he come at a time where I guess, I mean, we've had you on the pod quite a few times talking about the negatives of what's happening at Chelsea. Does Crisis like, correspondent. Cr I'm just saying it, you yeah. called it. Does he come into the club at a time where actually Chelsea are looking for a, that hero-like status, someone that can drive this kind of new regime into the, the, the new frontier? Yeah, I think Chelsea as a club have been looking for a talisman ever since Eden Hazard left mm -hmm. in the summer of 2019. And this ownership have been looking for a symbol of this project. I, mean, I don't think they set out to sign one superstar. You know, you sign as many players as they have, you want uh, more great players than just one. And I think they believe they've got that. But you know, for Palmer to be producing at the level that he is already. He doesn't turn 23 until May. Mm -hmm. uh, th this is why you recruit so aggressively. This is why you over overhaul a squad and establish an entirely new 
identity as a club really is to is to find a talent like this and now they've got one and I'm sure we'll come on to it mm -hmm. um you know they fully intend to keep him around for as long as possible and for him to be the one that they're building everything around you can see that through the bottom line goal and assist numbers almost every Chelsea attack goes through him at some point whether he's finishing it or quite often initiating it um and I think they're, they're actually more positive signs for Chelsea in that with the other attacking players they've signed now, his stats may go up, but his burden is slightly less. Mm. Last season, it felt like everything was on him. And for a stretch of the season, he was pretty much the only reason to go to Stamford Bridge to watch a game. That's not the case now. And I think you're already seeing, you know, Jadon Sancho's made a very positive start. What he's doing off the left flank mm. will divide the attention of defences and prevent them from keying in so much on Palmer and Noni Madweke just outside him. And, and that should help him in the long term. But he doesn't need a lot of help because he's been doing this since day one, since he came into the team. He's dovetailing really nicely with Jackson as well. And it, it looks like there's, there's confidence growing at the front of the team and, and as a result spreading through the, the rest of the team as well, which seemed to be an issue at, at Chelsea last season. You, you said there that... Um, Chelsea weren't kind of looking for a superstar when they went after Palmer. But do you think they kind of knew deep down that they were potentially getting one? And, and did they expect him to be this good? I'm not sure anyone expected him to be this good, certainly not this fast. Chelsea had big believers in Palmer. I mean, you, you talk about someone like Joe Shields, who they brought from Southampton, was really, you know, made his name in recruitment at Manchester City in youth recruitment, knew Palmer as well as anyone in football. Um so they, they, I think they were pretty confident in their talent assessment of what Palmer was and what he could be. But the idea that he would come into the team and average a, more than a goal or, a, or an assist a game almost, um, virtually from the moment he started playing, I think that has exceeded everyone's expectations. But now you can see it with the new contract that, that he's been given. He's, he's one of two nine-year men mm. in the squad with Nicholas Jackson. But he's actually worth it, though, isn't he? You can, yeah. you can kind of see the sense in tying him down to, to 2033, I think it is. Whereas yeah. some of Chelsea's longer contracts, you think, I can't quite see the sense in that, or, or this seems, almost seems pointless in doing that. With, with Palmer, you, you protect him for as long as you can. Well, this is, you know, I th I'm sure they, they would say, this is the validation of the strategy. This is why you give out these ultra-long contracts, because... OK, you might have a Mudrick situation where you have a player not performing and that might be difficult to get out, out from. But if you get a player as good as Palmer looks to be, they're in an incredibly strong position to keep him for a long time or if they have to sell him, to sell him on their terms, at their price. Uh, and, and so that's there are no bad choices for them with Cole mm. Palmer now, really. Um, although I think, you know, if he's as good as he's looked for the past season, I think, selling him at all would be a bad choice for any for any price it would kind of be an admission of of sporting failure because the best teams need players like him yeah for sure well we've already spoken about some really impressive stats uh around Cole Palmer but it's time to hear from our senior data analyst Mark Carey for a deeper dive on Palmer's numbers <laughs> Cole Palmer's four goals against Brighton fast-tracked him to six in six for the season. It is Palmer! Oh, wow. As things stand, Palmer's rate of 0.57 expected assists, which measure the expected goals value of the shot that is assisted, per 90 minutes is the best of any midfielder or forward who has played at least 500 minutes in the Premier League this season. Now, this essentially shows how good he is at, at finding that eye for a pass for for runners ahead of him and we know about his creativity as well as his goal scoring. What's most impressive to me is, is just how involved he is in nearly every attacking sequence that Chelsea have and that's led on from last season as well where he was almost carrying the, the fight single-handedly at times for Chelsea and if we break down a player's involvement in shot ending sequences between their shots, their chances created and their involvement in the wider build-up within that attacking sequence, you can already see that Palmer leads the way among all Chelsea players this season in the same way that he did last season. And essentially, you can pretty much be sure that whenever Chelsea do anything good going forward, Palmer's fingerprints are usually there somewhere along the sequence chain.
Yeah, that was uh, Mark Carey on his view on on Cole Palmer. Um, Liam, you know, the headline to your piece asks if Cole Palmer is the best attacking player in the Premier League. I mean, from Mark's point of view, sounds like it could be irking on that kind of space. But, you know, Maresca, after the Brighton match, sort of alluded to the fact that he thought this was the best attacking player in the Premier League. Yeah, he said it in a funny way. He kind of th- threw it in in passing in the context of a bigger answer saying mm. nothing will change Cole Palmer as a person. You know, he was saying like, uh, you know, all these all these accolades, best player in the Premier League, none of it will change him. He, he didn't ex- explicitly mm. say in the way that like a Jose Mourinho might, you know, my player's the, the best guy <laughs> here. But um, it wouldn't surprise me if he thinks that. Mm. And and it wouldn't surprise me if in the near future he says it more forcefully, uh, particularly if Palmer continues to play like this. I think, look, people are going to have different answers. It is fundamentally subjective, and I think it comes down partly to what you value. Because as Phil highlighted, if you just want someone to score a goal, mm. Erling Haaland is going to be the first yeah. pick every day of the week. But Cole Palmer does a lot more than that. He doesn't score as much, certainly not from open play. But you want someone to take a penalty. Mm. I know he picked Mario Bellatelli in an interview this week as a guy to take a penalty to save his life. But Palmer himself would be high on that list, I think. Um, or to create a chance. He would be you know, right up there with the very, very best in the world, not just in the Premier League right now. Yeah, um, something you guys spoke about earlier that got me thinking about his role in this team is that and Mark actually alluded, alluded to it in that last season he looked like the person that was dragging Chelsea through it this season it feels like from where I'm sitting things are looking a little bit more how can I put it spread out across the Chelsea front line anyway um, Nicholas Jackson for instance looking like he's actually scoring goals Do you think a player like Palmer allows players around him to be better yeah I think he, he does elevate his teammates but equally I think it is a healthier ecosystem at, at Chelsea this year. And that's not that's not a slant at Mauricio Pochettino. I mm. think it's a reflection partly of the fact that a lot of these players have had a year together. Mm. So you've got that latent chemistry between him and Madweke, who've, I mean, they've played in the England youth levels anyway, known each other for a long time. Him and Jackson clearly have a good understanding that's been built over the course of the last year. You add Jaden Sancho to that from the other side, and he's shown really good signs immediately that he has... The instincts to combine with those with those players, and that's before you even consider mm. Nkunku, João Felix, the other players that they can throw in to the starting lineup or throw on at a certain stage of a game. There are so many players that can pull defenders away from Palmer, and he's so good at finding space anyway that I think it gives him more moments in the game with the ball at his feet mm. to to make decisions, and he generally makes the right decisions. That will make his teammates better but it'll also put him in more positions to score goals. I, I don't know if you guys remember, but we spoke about Chelsea before the season started and mm. we were trying to decide, are they going to have a good season? I think at the end of the, the conversation, we are talking about, are they going to finish fourth? And we all kind of said, we don't know. I think you said that they're like the, the great unknown. Could finish fourth, could finish 11th, could be a disaster, could be could be great. And I think sometimes when you're looking in from the outside, it's quite it can look quite nonsensical at Chelsea. But one of the things Maresca has done really well so far is to kind of make sense of what is a really big squad and really big dressing room and actually quite a difficult quite a difficult choice of working out what your best 11 is or what your most effective 11 mm. is. But I definitely think that Palmer is helping with that. I, I totally agree with what Mark Carey was saying about the fact that when you watch Chelsea, Palmer is always in the thick of it. He's always near the ball or or on the ball. You see the stats about Haaland. And again, I think this is a compliment for Haaland, not a, a criticism, but of the way he can go through games without touching the ball much, but still comes up with goals, assists, what, whatever it is. Palmer's the kind of the total opposite, really dynamic and always there right in the middle of it. And I think you're right. I think his, like his form and, and the way he's playing is definitely rubbing off on, on other people around him. I think you're seeing that in Jackson in particular at the mm. moment. Yeah, what do you... Th- where do you think he ranks them, Phil? Um, because if we are alluding to the fact that he's one of the best attacking players in the league, and there are others, Saka, Foden, for instance, uh, Mohamed Salah. Where, where yeah. does he sit in that Yeah, mix? for sure. And it's funny, you know, Maresca saying that, and, and Liam was making the mm. point that Maresca wasn't trying to sit there and say, this is the best player mm. in the Premier League. But it's actually not much of a headline statement because if you look at his performances and, and his numbers, then he's easily in that arm wrestle. Um, and I think it is 
subjective or it's a, it's a matter of opinion, but you're talking about small degrees either way. If you favour Haaland, you're in no way saying that, that Palmer isn't right on his, you know, right on his tail. Um, I think pound for pound, most people are still going for Haaland, aren't they? If you, mm. if you can have mm. anybody. Um, but I think if you put Palmer up for sale tomorrow, certainly at £40 million, pounds, you'd have everybody in Europe trying to, <laughs> trying to take him. He's going to be that sort of player, isn't he? He's going to be tough for Chelsea to hold on to um, if they don't start to get themselves into contention for trophies. But if they do get into contention for trophies, it will be because they've got somebody like him in the team. Yeah. Um, Liam, uh, Maresco also spoke about, you know, the fact that he's a humble guy. And for me, that's the most important thing, he said. You know, Palmer, I guess, isn't exactly, we talk about people like Haaland. You see what brand Haaland is, right? <laughs> it's yeah. bigger than Haaland himself. Um, you know, you get a sense that this is a lad that loves his football a lot. And we were talking just before we started recording the pod and how beautiful that is uh, as, as for, the, for the fairy tale of football. Kid from the streets, done well, humble, just loves to play his football. Do you think that's why he's quite endearing to football fans? Yeah, I think uh, to use that horrible marketing word, he's authentic. <laughs> right. It's a very kind of authentic <laughs> brand where, like, you know, the way he does interviews, mm. I don't think he's the easiest interview, but it's in quite a funny way, the way that he answers questions. Um, and just the, the the way that he carries himself on the pitch, the celebration, mm. which I think the celebration's already iconic. Sorry, Morgan Rogers. <laughs> he's, he's trying hard to cling on to that, Rogers, isn't he? Yeah, and, and I like, you know, I don't think... Palmer has like explicitly said, "Oh, it's mine now." But mm. you know, they're, they're obviously good friends. But it's clearly Cole Palmer. You go on, the, go on the latest EA game. I think it's uh, <laughs> there's no one else doing that. I think it's there's the no Palmer Ice Cold <laughs> celebration. So that's the brand, isn't it? It's yeah. his personality. It's it's everything around that, um, and it it's quite funny because I think we've seen with footballers over the last 10 years that they can build very different types of brands. Like Messi was almost a silent brand, mm. wasn't he? It was all football Built based. Himself, didn't he? Yeah. yeah. And I think that's, I'd say yeah. on, on the degree of the spectrum that would, Palmer would probably be closer to that in that mm. he's just going to let his football do the talking most of the time. But the way he plays has so much personality in it that he doesn't really have to say very much when he's, whenever he's required to talk. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a very good piece on The athletic, um, athletic, I think it was Sam Lee who wrote it, and it's about Brand Haaland and, and what they're trying to do with him. Things like him being in the Clash of the Clans um, video game, which I must confess I had to Google after I read about it. Can't say I've played it, mate. Can't say I've played it. because I'm 43. Um, but in all seriousness, they were saying in there, you know, the, the people around him and the team who are trying to build mm. this brand think that he could be worth a billion pounds, um, Haaland, because of, you know, the, the plans they've got for... Um, AI things, VR things, you know, all, all that that type of stuff. Um, and with Palmer, it seems different at the moment, and he doesn't seem as if he's chasing any of that. It might be over time, if he continues being this good, that that happens kind of organically for him, and people around him start to say, look, there's a lot of money to be made here, and, and you really should promote yourself. But he does genuinely seem like somebody who's just enjoying life as it is at the moment, mm -hmm. and is, is quite happy to be in the thick of it at Chelsea, doing great at Chelsea, but away from that, to be quite quiet and, and reserved and, and quite hidden from view, which can't be a bad thing. And that's kind of a continuation from what Chelsea had with Eden Hazard as well. Uh, and one of the things that I think he maybe found difficult when he went to Real Madrid, aside from all the injuries, you're going from a place where you can be pretty anonymous day to day, week to week at Cobham, you know, walking down Cobham High Street, going to the supermarket. There were loads of stories like that with Hazard. Um, to like the world's biggest football goldfish bowl in in Madrid and like yeah I get I, I do get the impression just from the outside that Palmer is a similar kind of personality and that it is really just football for him okay well let's move on and while we're talking about Chelsea let, let's look at how Chelsea acquired Cole Palmer um Liam can you just give us a little reminder as to how Chelsea managed to get hold of him and I think Phil alluded to it earlier for not much, £42.5 million. Pounds. Yeah, it's interesting the way we talk about that transfer fee now because, you know, at the time, quite a few people, not just in the media, but within football, were looking at the fee going, hang on, what's Cole Palmer done to merit a fee mm. like that? Like, It was within the context of Chelsea being perceived to, you know, be wildly overspending on all sorts of players and, and just signing too many footballers full stop. And I think... The Palmer transfer was was initially viewed through that prism, and we we did a, a piece talking to a load of anonymous agents at the time, where 
think the famous quote that a lot of Chelsea fans <laughs> still bring up is like, explain Cole Palmer to me <laughs> from one of the agents. Doesn't need explaining now. And we, mm. we look at that fee you know, as, a, as a total bargain. Um, I, I think I did a piece with a CIES observatory about six months ago on the, the value of Chelsea's squad and the individual players within that. He was already easily the most valuable player, but it was, it was well in excess of 100 million before he did what he'd done to start this season. Uh, so I, again, I think Chelsea are in a position where if they ever wanted to sell Cole Palmer or he wanted to leave, it, you know, they, they could name their price. But I must stress that everything we've been told from the very start by this, by this ownership and you know, people around them, people who know what they want to do, is that the strategy is not just to acquire the best young talent in the world. It's then to retain that talent. They think it would be easier to buy these players pre-prime mm -hmm. and then retain them through their prime years rather than trying to go out and sign an Mbappe when he's Mbappe. So that, I think, is the plan with Cole Palmer. You've, you've got him before he was a superstar. He's exploded at Stamford Bridge. And now, if you want to be a serious team that competes for trophies again, you need players like that driving you on. So I think Chelsea's plan is firmly to have him central to what they do for years to come. Mm. You, you certainly win some, lose some. We, we've had this habit on The Athletic um, right from the start, really, at the end of every transfer window, we speak to agents um, uh, anonymously, which is good because then they can say what they what they really think. Um, and as with the, you know, explain Cole Palmer to me, I remember somebody, uh, agent saying to me after um, Manchester United signed Jaden Sancho, you know, I just don't get that at all. I don't get the size of the fee. I don't think it's a good deal. I think they've massively overspent. Mm. And I think, I mean, we'll see with Sancho as, as time goes on, whether how history judges him. But I think certainly that transfer um, wasn't good money. You know, it was it, it was overpriced and it didn't work out. Whereas with Cole Palmer, I think, I think I was kind of the same at £40 million. I was thinking that's quite a lot of money for somebody who doesn't have a huge sample size when it comes to performances. But on the basis of what was being said at City, you could tell that he was, he was hugely talented. And the fact is, you know, English players in England um, at that sort of age with that sort of potential are really expensive. Yeah, that's um, why I wasn't too worried about the fee because you just know about the English player premium, especially yeah, if you're coming from yeah. a team like Manchester City, for instance, with such a wonderful academy. Yeah, um, and I, I do, I, I do sympathise with City as well because. They'll be looking at that now and thinking we could have made a lot more money on mm. Palmer. And, and as you say, if Chelsea end up selling him, they almost certainly will make a lot of money on him. But it's very difficult to stockpile top class players. Um, and, and City have, even if you look at Palmer now and think, well, you know, he would be very, very helpful for Guardiola. He would probably make a big difference in the title race with, with Arsenal if it is going to be head to head between those two again. You have Foden and you have Savino and you have Doku and you've got Haaland up front and you. I know sometimes people look at Chelsea and think Chelsea are stockpiling, but you cannot just have like endless resource there, especially players who aren't going to get many minutes. And mm. I think that was the thing with Palmer. I could never quite work out, and Liam might be able to answer this, whether it was Palmer who really wanted to go or whether it was City who were selling him because he wasn't going to get much in the way of game time. Um, but I can see why it happened. And, and yes, like history might be quite critical of the fee, but, you know, it, it was just one of those circumstances, I think. I think primarily because it, it all came to a head quite late in the summer. I think primarily it was Palmer wanting to go and play and put himself in a position where he was in, you might laugh, you know, like a stable environment. I know Chelsea didn't look that way mm. at the time, but sign a long contract somewhere so you know that club's invested in you. I think he was still looking at Chelsea as a major club because they weren't that far removed from contention. Obviously, you get the pitch from mm. the people at the top of Chelsea about how ambitious this project is. So I think that was all part mm. of it. And then you add, you know, City see an opportunity to generate a chunk of pure profit mm. for PSR to offset their own spending. It kind of worked for everyone at the time. And, I'd, you know, I'd... I'd I don't think it's a. I don't think honestly that we'll look back on this situation as one to really bash City for. No, because they had at the time the best squad in the world, and yeah, okay, in a vacuum, yes, you sold low on what Cole Palmer would become, but he wouldn't have got the opportunity to generate that value mm -hmm. at City. The the value is tied to minutes and tied to responsibility, and even when he was getting minutes for City, he didn't have the level of responsibility that he was given almost immediately at Chelsea. Uh, so I, 
I think they they probably look at it clearly. There's a there's an element of sadness there. I would I would imagine, um, given that they'd much rather see him be this player in a in a city shirt. But I think it, you know it, it's not quite a case of Chelsea with De Bruyne, where you know you get a guy and then you sell him for about two three times what you paid him for, but still about a tenth of his mm-hmm. peak value. Not because he wasn't good enough to play for you, but just because you didn't manage him, manage the relationship, manage his development well enough. Okay, well, let's move on to Cole Palmer at Chelsea and I guess what he offers that team in many respects. You know, he's sort of picked off from where he left off last season, Liam. Um, and I guess coming into this season, it seems much better uh, as a player. Um, have you been surprised by how well Chelsea as a team with him in tow have started this season, considering what we've been talking about? I mean, speaking about in terms of the manager changes and the, the amount of players that are currently at that squad, um, are you surprised that Chelsea have actually hit the ground relatively running? I don't know really. I mean, you know, I do remember the pod that we did where mm. I, I just didn't know how to feel about how mm. they would start the season. And I thought the, I thought having City at home on the opening weekend was dangerous because if they'd lost that in a really embarrassing way, I thought it could set a very bad tone for the start of the season. They did lose pretty comfortably, but not embarrassingly so. And I do think Maresca has pivoted pretty impressively since then. I think the the main thing that's impressed me about Maresca is that he hasn't actually been as much of a tactical ideologue mm. as I thought he might be coming in, as we were told he might be mm. coming in. As um, he was at Leicester. Well, yeah. The yeah, yeah, there hasn't much. been like such a stylistic dogma in the way Chelsea play. I mean, they had 40% possession against Brighton. Mm. And that was partly because Brighton set up in such an extreme way, defending their own halfway line, basically, giving 50 yards of space mm. that the only logical thing to do is to play first time pass after first time pass in in behind or over the top of them but there have been a few games like that where chelsea have moved the ball from back to front much quicker than we thought they would and maresca has at times said they're moving a little bit quick for him but he's clearly not minded to make a massive issue of it because he also knows that he's got players that thrive in those situations and palmer in particular while chelsea felt very chaotic as a team under Pochettino last year. He he thrives in chaos. Mm. <laughs> Those little broken moments of a game where teams aren't quite set mm. and not every player is fully paying attention. That's when he hits you with a pass or or he'll drop a shoulder and go past you or drift into a scoring position. Um, and so I think Maresca has been smart enough to, to realise, and he said this very early on, we need to let Cole be Cole. Obviously, he knew him really well from Manchester City's, City's development squad. But he's, in the way that Pochettino started him on the right, but allowed him to come in and be the number 10 a lot of the time, Maresca, it, it looks slightly different because he's basically in the midfield three. He's the, num- he's the right side in number eight, but he's still really in the same areas. He's in that right half space. He's, coming, he's acting as the number 10, mm-hmm. running beyond the striker sometimes. He's getting a lot of freedom to do, to interpret the game. And I think when you've got a player as clever as Cole Palmer is, I think that's the only thing to do, really, because he can see possibilities that you can't from the touchline. He's also very impervious to the noise around Chelsea. That was really notable last season. And again, this season, it doesn't seem to particularly impinge on the way that that he plays. And I think Mm -hmm. Chelsea obviously need really talented players if they're going to compete more than than they have um, in, in previous seasons. But they also need people who are big enough and broad enough to cope with the environment and the pot shots that, that come at Chelsea and the, and the pressure that seems to build up there really quickly when, when things start start going wrong. I think the, the quality of the season or how well they, they do this season is going to come down to games like City and, and I think more particularly games against Liverpool, Spurs, mm. um, you know, that Newcastle, those, those sort of fixtures when, when they'll get really tested. But what I think I would say at this point with Maresca is that the way it started makes you think that if... If you are prepared to, to stick with this and if the improvement that you've seen in Palmer and subsequently in you know other people like Jackson and, and so on, Sancho now, um, if that continues, then they could be onto something quite good here, mm. actually. And despite the scepticism and despite the fact that over the summer it was hard not to look at it and think, like, is this going to work? And, and yeah. on, on a I know we would have had that conversation, and, yeah, and, and, I remember And that. on what basis would you bet the house You know mm. that, that it is going to work? I think now you could say to yourself, well, 
hard to see how far this will actually go, but it doesn't look like a terrible model to me. The thing they're not doing at the moment that they need to do in the long term if Mariska wants to build a really high-level Chelsea team is control games. They didn't really control the game against Brighton. They 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 just overwhelmed them with superior firepower, mm. basically. And that's an option that Maresca has that Pochettino didn't really have last year. With the attackers they've added, with Nkunku fit again, they have the ability to win games like the one away at Bournemouth where they were outplayed mm. tactically as, as much as physically, uh, um, but they get a goal out of nowhere and, and just steal two points, really. Um, there will be other op- opportunities for them to do that this season and they're more equipped to take advantage of those opportunities than they've ever been. But if they want to be a really top team to play at the level that we've seen City and Arsenal play at and, and Liverpool, of course, in, in previous years, they have to control games consistently or at least the bulk of games. And we, aside from the first half against Crystal Palace, I don't think we've really seen Chelsea do that yet. And that's I think that's going to be high on Maresca's priority list. One thing Phil spoke about was, you know, more challenging games coming, you know, the Liverpools of this world, the Arsenals of this world. And I look at the decision to, you know, rest Cole Palmer from the European Conference League. Um, how important is that so that Chelsea are able to compete at that level in the Premier League against the real top opposition? Because actually, Chelsea are in the top half of the table and maintaining that position, you have to beat the big boys or at least compete with the big boys. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, t- top four is not just Chelsea's number one priority. It's so far clear of the mm. number two priority mm. that you can barely see it. You know, they've been out of the Champions League for too, far too long as far as the ownership are concerned. They're, they do believe there's a, there's a top four level of talent in this squad. And you want to give yourself the best possible chance to, to get there this year. And leaving Cole Palmer out of the Conference League group stage, frankly, if you, if you need him for the Conference League group stage, something is very wrong. <laughs> You know, they should have enough good players to, to get through that in relative comfort without him. And just giving him those midweeks off, particularly after a summer in which, OK, he didn't play every game for England, but he still went to Euro 2024, mm. missed all of pre-season. You are going to have to be a little bit careful with him from September to December, particularly to make sure you don't overload him for the business end of the, the campaign. So I think, um, you know, for him not playing against Ghent, for example should bode well for Chelsea against Nottingham Forest. Mm. And you contrast that with you know the burden that someone like Bukayo Saka has at Arsenal now with their other injuries and their involvement in the Champions League. He's got a good platform to continue being maybe the best attacker in the Premier League because he's, he might not be playing as many minutes as a lot of his rivals. Mm. I think Mares will be very aware of how difficult he is to replace. Um, and at the moment, it's probably irreplaceable in this this Chelsea team. And I don't think there's anybody who's going to come in and, and play as well as as, as he is. Um, so it makes total sense not to, to risk him in those games. And I mean, Liam's right. If if it's not top four for Chelsea, what is it this season? You know, that that is what they have to go after. Yeah, well, top four means Champions League football potentially next season, uh, uh, Liam. And I do wonder, you know, you've got a player on such a long contract. If Chelsea aren't able to hit those highs... Do we worry that Cole Palmer might be looking elsewhere for his football because he's a player that's good enough to play at that level? Yeah, I think that's I think that's always got to be something in your mind as a decision maker at a club when mm. you've got a player this good. You know, you have a responsibility to make the most of their talent and give them the ability to achieve what they want to achieve in their career. Uh, and if they don't feel they can achieve it where you are, then you know, there's going to come a point where they where they want to start looking somewhere else. Um, that that point is quite a long way down yeah, the line. I think it is. Yeah, I think I mean, it is. I mean, it might not be nine years. Down I was going to say it's nine years. Down. If they haven't it's, done it in nine years, you've got to worry. It's, what on it's earth? not going to be thirty-six <laughs> when he finally decides that he wants to, yeah, to exactly. win something. But I don't think in three months' time you're going to see Palmer saying no. it's not going well. This have had enough. No, you know, no, you, it, no, it, for sure. It'd be a, a much slower burn. If you say yeah, but that. Phil, if you say the next two or three seasons, Chelsea, uh, yeah, I think that's the Europa League. I mean, the lad has every, you know 
opportunity to say, do you know what? I appreciate the opportunity, but I, I want to go to Real Madrid. For With, instance, without, a doubt, without a doubt. But I think that timeline is long enough that it's not something that Chelsea need to worry about mm. at, at this stage. I think they've got the time to to let this grow slowly um, under, or gradually under under Maresca. And I think they'll be pretty happy with how it started. Well, that's mm. the thing. They're in the highest league position they've been in since the takeover. They've got this youngest squad in the league, which is now largely trending upwards. I know there are a few players that mm. people point out as having not worked, but I think there are a lot of Chelsea players that are looking at least to be decent signings. Um, and I think the message coming into this season was that they didn't necessarily expect results to be brilliant under Maresca immediately. There was a recognition that it's a new style of play. It would take time to bed in. Players would take time to adapt to it and to each other. Um, so the fact that they've got so many points on the board already, I think, will be a big source of encouragement to them. And they'll be looking at all of this thinking the the arrows are pointing upwards. And while the arrows are pointing upwards, these concerns, these theoretical concerns about someone like Cole Palmer are not going to be particularly prominent in anyone's minds. I think they're just thinking that Chelsea as a whole are, are, are moving in the right direction and Cole Palmer is helping to drive that. In that vein, Phil, do you think it's better for him to stay at Chelsea for the foreseeable? Oh, absolutely. And I mean, it, it just won't be a question for now about whether mm. that's that's going to happen. I mean, the, the, the contract thing is funny because you, you genuinely think to yourself, if he's this good and Chelsea become this good, then yeah, you could see him there in, in 2033. But mm. it just never happens that, does it? So so where this goes longer, te- longer term is, is really hard to say. But on the basis of what he's done at Chelsea, um, in the, the pretty short time he's been mm. there, be very hard for anybody to make the argument to him that you really need to be somewhere else. And if you if you were somewhere else now, say Real Madrid or something like that, you would be winning more trophies. There's no question about that. But his development has been so good, um, and he's made such a good impact at, at Chelsea that he will think himself, "This is pretty good for me." You mm. know, whatever it is that's going on here, and whether, whatever it's going over the next two or three years, this hasn't done me any harm at all. Um, and to go back to you know what we were saying about his kind of demeanour and attitude, how. how kind of low-key he seems to be. Um, I think, yeah, I think he'd be very settled at the moment. Yeah, fantastic. Let's end it there. Definitely a player with such a high ceiling. Liam, Phil, thanks so much for joining us in the studio. And also, thank you all for listening. We'll be back tomorrow. If you want to watch more episodes of the show, please subscribe to the channel. We'll be joined by the likes of David Ornstein, Matt Slater, Adam Crafton, Carl Anker, and plenty more through the season. If you'd like to listen to the episodes in full in audio form, Search The Athletic FC wherever you get your podcasts from.